<laughs> okay, well, welcome everyone to the GCT Survivor Sisters and Houston Institute of Medical Research webcast. I'm Sue Rogers, and today we will be presenting the past, present, and future on the ongoing GCT research project at Hudson, including questions from you submitted based on the five themes of the research. First, I'd like to introduce our panel today. Uh, we have representing Hudson Institute, Dr. Simon Chu, and Maria Alexiadis. And from Deakin University, we have Dr. Vicki White. Our GCT Survivor Sisters are represented by the admin research team of Kim Arrow and Koi Ackerman. Linda Langdale, and myself. <laughs> uh, now I'd like to give a little bit of history about our uh, group's association with Hudson. Since the inception of our group in 2012 by Kim Arrow, uh, we had been seeking uh, a research organization interested in using our clinically acquired knowledge of GCT. And it was back in early 2019 that Maria contacted us via our group asking to join and be a member. However, she was not eligible and we continued our conversations via email. Uh, Maria told us about the research project and the grant that was forthcoming from the Australian government and asked if we were interested in assisting them. It did not take us very long to say yes, <laughs> and we began this wonderful collaboration. We started by having a Zoom meeting, and in mid-2019, uh, we discussed uh, the contribution possibilities and began collecting tumor tissue samples later that year. In addition, we advised them about our members' diagnos diagnosis and treatment information spreadsheet that we had developed, and it was agreed that we would send this to Vicki, and she would begin the task of analyzing the data with the goal of publishing a research paper. That paper, uh, titled How Social Media can help to understand treatment experiences of rare cancers came to be and was published in the Medical Periodical Cancer in April of 2023. We are now working with Vicki on a new topic, uh, the radiotherapy survey that many of you have contributed to is the subject. So now, I would like to hand it over uh, the webcast to Dr. Chu uh, to speak about GCT, the history of research on the disease, and to begin discussions on the five themes and questions supplied by you, our sisters. Simon? Thank you so much, Sue, um, and uh, all of the GCT Survivor Sisters. Um, I think uh, the collaborations that we've uh, been able to form have been tremendous um, and are really helping to advance our, our research into, uh, into this um, uh, disease. So um, now I'm going to share my screen and I will find so, um, so again, I, I'd like to really thank uh, you all for joining us uh, this evening, this afternoon, and this morning, wherever you are. Uh, it, it's a truly a wonderful uh, bit of technology now that we can be all linked in together like this and, and, and be able to discuss the research. And, and I'd like to really thank also the, the wonderful artistic talents that are on display, uh, being able to piece together this, uh, this little flyer. Well done. Um, before I start, I'd like to just acknowledge the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which uh, I work and pay uh, my respects to, the, to their elders past and present. Um, so 
this is a, a just a, a picture of one of the buildings that is part of our institute. It's actually one of the newer buildings here, um, and uh, we really like to sort of uh, be able to uh, use uh, a lot of our uh, technologies now that are located in this building to be able to help, as as mentioned there, advancing the our, our understanding treatment of ovarian granulose cell tumors. Um, so. A lot of this you will already know, uh, but I'll just give a brief overview of, of uh, what uh, GCTs are. Now, we all know with ovarian cancer that the, by far the majority of ovarian cancers are those of the epithelial type, um, and, and they gen generally uh, fall into several categories, but the most common of which are the serious ovarian cancers. Um, there is this uncommon category called the sex cord stromal tumors, and this is where granulosa cell tumors fall in. And, and again, granulosa cell tumors by far are, are the majority of this tumor type. Um, and, and so uh, uh, this is where we are really trying to uh, understand uh, why these tumors arise. Um, I'm going to go to the highlighter because I think the pointer. I don't think you can see that. See, um, so so in terms of uh, these tumors, um, they fall within this category, and of these, the the majority of granulosa cell tumors are termed adult GCT, which are defined by Foxl2 mutation C134W, and we'll get into that a little bit later as to to what that means. So some of the clinical features of GCT, now these are by far not uh, uh, necessarily uh, uh, what one would see in every single case, but the peak incidence is between 50 to 60 years in general. And there's a, a, a more uncommon type of GCT known as, five, uh, G, as juvenile GCT, which uh, account for about 5% of all granulosa cell tumors. And these can manifest in much younger uh, women and um, uh, females and, and girls. So the symptoms are usually the result of these excess estrogen secretion. Uh, so things like vaginal bleeding or abdominal pelvic pain uh, are associated with this um, uh, ex excess estrogen secretion. And in general, they do have a better prognosis than the epithelial tumors, and that's really because the majority of them are actually caught early due to the fact that uh, there are these uh, endocrine manifestations. Um, and so the, uh, the, the good news is that for a lot of women who are, uh, are found early, um, the prognosis is really good. Um, primary treatment is surgical. It, but however, intra-abdominal spread makes the complete removal difficult. And these have a propensity, these tumors have a propensity for late recurrence, where sometimes they can occur in the literature up to 30 years post their initial diagnosis. Um, and, and then it's there here where recurrent disease is usually treated with chemotherapy, but it's often met with limited success. And, and that's really prim primarily due to the fact that regimens are often based on the platinum containing protocols that are used for uh, the epithelial ovarian cancers. And, and we know that these are very different tumor types. And so it isn't uh, any wonder why these uh, protocols don't uh, work on granulosa cell tumors. So hence that means then that there is really a great need to find more targeted, better therapies. Now, well, what are granulosa cells? So if you actually look at a, a, an ovary, this is a schematic of an ovary here. Um, in, the, in the ovary, of course, the ovary is uh, responsible for uh, maturing the eggs to ovulation. Um, and so there's a process we call folliculogenesis, which helps to mature these eggs to this point of ovulation um, and then fertilization of the egg. Um, granulosa cells are a cell that actually surrounds the egg as a single layer through a, a few of these different 
parts of follicular genesis. However, under the influence of estrogen and FSH and other growth factors, um, granulosa cells then rapidly divide and they become multi-layer and they become, they, 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 they're in their millions at this point in time and they are there to help nurture and feed the egg to help it to mature into uh, that, that dominant uh, egg for fertilization. And uh, it's somewhere along this process that our work has been looking at to work out where these granulosa cells uh, have, uh, what stage of follicular genesis uh, do these granulosa cells arise from? And, and so a lot of our early preliminary uh, studies um, really identified that probably these, uh, the tumor cells are very similar to those of a late pre-ovulatory uh, granulosa cell that is rapidly dividing. So for many years, the events that caused the granulosa cell to become a granulosa cell tumor were relatively unknown. Uh, until in 2009, this seminal paper uh, was uh, published that identified a mutation in the FOXL2 gene in, uh, for, for granulosa cell tumors. And uh, in, in a sense, what happened here was that a group uh, in Canada uh, used just four samples to be able to look at the RNA uh, levels of different genes. And they found that in fact that when they, when they looked at uh, whole transcriptome sequencing of the, of the genes in, this, uh, in these four tumors, they identified a common mutation in the FOXL2 gene. So they then moved to archival material and they identified in fact that in 86 of 89 adult GCTs, this mutation was present. And interestingly, it's not present in any other tumors, including the juvenile GCT. And so, and Maria is going to touch on this further later on, but uh, we know then that the FOXL2 mutation is a very early event, and it's an early event to allow a, a granulosa cell to, to go along their way to becoming cancerous. So the questions in our lab over the years have been, can we predict recurrence? And what's the etiology of aggressive or recurrent advanced disease? And whether we can find disease specific therapies and so we've been really interested to look at the genomic uh, changes that occur after this early event. So what other genetic uh, uh, changes occur in a granulosa cell tumor cell that causes it to become aggressive or recurrent? And whether any of these um, mutations or genetic events that we, we, we discover, can they be amenable for a disease specific therapy? So we've been really interested in looking at, at certain aspects. Now, I I'm, I'm don't want to bore you a lot with the science, but what we have been looking at is uh, nuclear receptors or the hormone receptors. You may have heard about the hormone receptors such as estrogen receptor, progesterone receptors, and so forth. So we've been look, interested in looking at these. Um, we've also been look, interested in looking at very uh, dominant survival pathways that are involved in this uh, in the tumors. And one particular pathway that we focused on is this pathway called NF kappa B. And uh, in particular, one of the proteins in this family in this pathway called XIAP. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. And as Maria will also touch on uh, in her part about using whole transcriptome analysis and whole exome and whole genome analysis to try and identify these genetic uh, events that occur. So over the years then, we've been working hard to do a lot of those molecular studies and then the opportunity uh, arise to be able to uh, collaborate not only with the GCT Survivor Sisters, but also Rare Ovarian Cancer Incorporated, a, a smaller uh, uh, foundation here in Australia looking at juvenile GCT 
And uh, we were able to collaborate too with uh, uh, Doc, uh, Professor Vicky White in formulating a grant that would be show that would, would show patient partnered research. And uh, and so we designed this MRFF, an Australian grant scheme, uh, which opened in 2020. We designed a project titled Towards a New Era in Granulose Cell Tumor Research, Patient-Driven Outcomes, Genomics and Therapeutics. And, and this is the, uh, the, a, a picture really to show what the grant's intentions were. And that is that our collaborations with consumers and patients through GCT Survivor Sisters and Rock Inc and various other lived smaller organizations that we can advance our understanding of both adult GCT and juvenile GCT to address the gaps that are in the research. So the gap areas of epidemiology, health science, biology, etiology, diagnosis and drug repurposing. And, and basically by, by uh, putting all of these gaps, we've uh, formulated five particular themes which we will address. The patient experience, the genomic landscape, the molecular pathogenesis or the, the, the molecular events that occur, um, inhibin assay, which I know is very uh, uh, prime in your thinking uh, to, to those who are survivors, and also therapeutics as well. And, and the information that we glean from these five themes are there to better understand the causes and underlying factors that contribute to the development of the pro and progression of GCT, to lead, which leads to improved diagnosis and treatment of GCT and that these outcomes of course then feed back to our consumer and patient groups. So these are the themes that are written in, in, in word form. So the theme one centered around social media and the patient experience and, and that's going to be left for Vicky to address in, in a very short while. Um, so that's using your real world data to be able to identify those gaps in patient information, clinical care, health and services and support. And then we'll consider the next four themes after that uh, through a, a, a series of various um, uh, talks that both Maria and I will give. But what I'll do now is just uh, transition to, to from, from theme one uh, to Professor Vicky White, who we've had a, a wonderful a fantastic collaboration and being able to uh, work on this project together. And Vicky has, of course, done so much hard work, and it will be really uh, fantastic to be able to hear uh, her, her, uh, the outcomes that she's discovered through this um, particular part of the partnership, as well as the the, the new um, uh, findings that we've been able to find as well. So I'm going to stop my share there. And I'm going to now hand over to Vicky and I will stop talking. Thanks, Simon. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me and I'd like to say um, hello, good morning from Australia um, and thank you very much for uh, uh, letting me talk to you and for inviting me um, to participate in this webinar. It's a great opportunity. I'm going to share my screen and um, uh, probably have the same same situation as Simon of trying to get the right uh, uh, format happening. Okay, thank you. So, okay, thank you very much um, for inviting me. Now, I just want to give you an informa information about me because unlike Simon and Maria, I come from a very different discipline and I'm at the um, School of Psychology at Deakin University, which is a university here in Melbourne, or actually it's in Geelong in Victoria, Australia. Um, and the most of my research over the years has been looking at um, how behavioural, well, it's behavioural research in cancer control. And just to give you some idea about what that means, I just want to talk a, bit, a little bit about the sort of research that we've been doing and how that influences sort of cancer control. And so one of the things we look at, um, or I've been looking at, is sort of risk factors for cancer. So have been working in the area of adolescent smoking behaviours and also a little bit of sun exposure, which is quite important down here in Australia as we have quite high rates of melanoma. Um, there's also work being done looking at how we can encourage people to participate in screening programs, so encouraging people to identify cancer at an early, early stage. 
Um, once people are affected by cancer, I've been doing some work looking at how we can better support people through their diagnosis, through their um, uh, treatment pathway, but also post-cancer um, treatment and looking at survivorship and how we can improve people's um, outcomes for survivorship, so quality of life, meeting supportive care needs, and looking at some interventions to, to try to um, really understand better ways to, to support people. And of particular importance to this group, we've also been doing some work which we've called um, trying to understand patterns of treatment or patterns of care. And this is trying to see how people with particular types of cancer um, are treated at a, at a sort of population level. And the idea of that is really to try to get a sense of where there's unwarranted variation in care so that we can then go in and work with the health professionals and say, well, this is, this is care that's deviating from best practice. And, um, you know, we need to try to work out a way that we can ensure that all the people who are diagnosed with this cancer can really start to receive that optimal care that we know is good for their outcomes. And so that's where your work has um, your survey. Oh, sorry. So just to show you some um, some of the types of papers that we've been doing. In. So this is the work in tobacco control that's looked at how tobacco control policies um, has influenced um, smoking rates in adolescents. This is some work looking at uh, people uh, with cancer, looking at how their information needs or whether their, um, their quality of life is influenced by um, so, uh, social factors like um, employment, uh, like SES. Um, and we've also looked at some work around the caregivers, so people who support people with cancer and, and what their needs are um, as well. For some of the interventions we've done, we've tried to um, link people, have link people into telephone support systems to see whether that's advantageous in terms of man managing anxiety or um, uh, information needs. Um, and we've also, this one down here that's looking at this ACE program is looking at um, an app and how that could be used to help people navigate through a health system um, and try to provide them with some of that information they need, just really practical information around how do, how do you manage a, a health hospital system that's very unfamiliar to many people when they're first diagnosed with cancer. Um, and then this is some work we've done looking at patterns of care. So we've looked at how um, uh, early stage renal cell carcinoma have been treated. And also um, I've had a lot of experience in the breast cancer area as well, looking at variations in, um, in care. And so that led us on to um, really when Peter and Simon and Maria came to talk to people at the Cancer Council here in Victoria, um, because of that experience that I've had, um, I was linked into their program of work and through that um, have been starting to work with the, with the Survivor Sisters and was in the very fortunate position to be able to work with the data that you guys had collected over the years to try to uh, present some information around um, uh, the patterns of treatment and, and your experiences of care. And so with... Um, with with the with the help and assistance and the really um, important understanding that Kim and Coy and Linda and um, and and Sue provided with the sort of um, uh, interpretation of the data, we put together the paper that was published in Cancer last year. And um, the really unique thing about that was was the number of people that participated in your work, the just size of the of the um, of the of the sample that we were able to use to to start to really look at how um, treatment um, was being delivered to people with GCT um, uh, tumors, GCT cancer, um, and so that was a, a unique study because we were really working with the with people with lived experience we had a nice editorial in the journal that um both promoted that notion of really working with people with rare tumors and that lived experience and also the use of social media to try to um make use of the sort of naturally forming groups of people um uh with with rare tumors and and so we can get the sort of numbers that we need to really understand what's going on with these people uh, with you sorry these people with you um, and just sort of some of the key findings, um, um, as Sue said, um, uh, it was published last year. Um, we had 743 people participate in the survey that was run. 67% was stage one disease. In general, the treatment patterns were really similar to findings from clinical audits. And these tend to be 
um, audits that are done within a particular treatment center, often in the US. Um, and as we found that most people had surgery um, and 19% of those with adult GCT had chemotherapy as well. Um, in our sample, there was about 30% that had recurrent disease. And of these, uh, recurrent recurrence occurred within five years. So while Simon was talking before about how, um, you know, recurrence can occur over a long period of time, there's also a large proportion of, of women who will get recurrent disease within five years of diagnosis. Um, and your survey data showed us that most of the recurrent disease was treated with surgery and with chemotherapy or with surgery alone. Um, and so with that great experience and publication, um, again, with Linda and Sue and Kim and um, Koi, we started working on um, uh, putting together a survey that was looking at people's experiences with radiotherapy. So one of the things that the survey showed, the previous survey showed, was that radiotherapy wasn't used very often um, for, GC, for treating GCT. And um, one of the things that that the team, um, the admin team at the Sisters Survive Sisters Facebook group really wanted to know is what people's experience was with with radiotherapy. And so um, uh, led by by your team, we uh, started to put together the, the survey with the aim of looking at what people's experience with radiotherapy was, how many people are having radiotherapy and identifying when it's generally used. So um, thank, I'd like to really thank everyone for taking part in the survey. Um, and we've had 805 people start the survey and um, about 730 have completed the survey altogether. Most people um, have been uh, people with GCT who've take, who's taken part in the survey. And we've had 4% of people with juvenile GCT and 96% with adult form. And just to give you an idea of where people are coming from and their years connected to the to the Facebook group, um, so most people are from um, the US and then from the UK, um, but predominantly um, from the US. And we've had a good spread of people who've been connected with GCT for a number of years. So um, there's sort of just under thirty percent who've been there for you know less than two years. But we've also got people um, nineteen percent who've been with the group for three to five years and um, another 30% who's been with the group for over five years. So um, nice spread of experiences with the GCT um, Facebook group as well, Sisters, Survivor Sisters group. So some of the information we collected again, just about the um, uh, you know diagnosis process and how what sort of tumors people were diagnosed with. And just this graph, um, these graphs here show you some of that information. So we have um, most people who were diagnosed with stage 1A and stage 1C tumours um, and then some information about the size of the tumours and um, I've put up here also the, you know, there's actual um, dimensions of people in, in centimetres but also people report having their, um, uh, their, their, the size of their tumour being described as a golf ball or a baseball or a football. Um, and so there's 9% of people who get that description of, of the tumour being a baseball or an orange size. Um, we also ask people around who's, who's in charge of their care. And you can see that most people are being treated by a gynae oncologist. Um, so that's seventy five percent of the of the people who responded to our survey, and fifteen percent said they were treated by a gynecologist um, without the specialisation in cancer as well. In terms of the initial treatment, um, we asked people around um, what sort of treatment they had initially for their uh, for their disease, and you can see again that most people have surgery. Um, four percent said they had radiotherapy at that initial treatment. I tried to look to see whether there were any factors that might have been associated with having radiotherapy at that treatment. And numbers are small, so we can't quite get any, um, uh, you know, make a lot of uh, lot of associations yet, just from a statistical point of view. But there was a slight trend for um, radiotherapy to be given with, with uh, larger tumours at diagnosis and also the type of doctor. So if someone was being seen by a gynae oncologist, there, there was a slight suggestion that they may have been more likely to um, have um, radiotherapy for the initial treatment, but there wasn't a lot of lot of difference going on and, and really the numbers are just a bit too small to make, um, uh, to make really firm statements about that association at the moment. 
Um, in terms of what people were were having their current management, so ninety two percent of people indicated that they um, they'd finished with their initial treatment, and they and then um, sixty six percent were generally in well sixty six percent were in um, follow up, actively being monitored by their specialist. Um, the people there were. Um, uh, 331 uh, respondents who said they were that their disease had reoccurred, and that was about 40 percent, just under 40 percent of people who answered the survey. And of the treatment that um, this group had seen, again, most commonly it was treated by surgery, but we had 25 percent of this group of people who had recurrent disease have radiotherapy. And they're the questions that they're the group that we ask quite a number of questions about of. And that's what we'll talk about now. So uh, 70 people responded to um, our sets of our, our um, radiotherapy questions. And um, there was a range of um, uh, number of rounds that people had. So people either had um, 25 people had one round of radiotherapy and 21 people said they had four or, four or more round of, of radiotherapy over their course of their disease. And 17 people said that they hadn't started their radiotherapy yet, it, but it was um, being planned. Um, uh, we asked people whether radiotherapy was discussed. And so 28 said that it had been discussed for their primary treatment. 106 said it was discussed for their um, recurrent disease. And 600 said that it wasn't discussed at all. Of those who um, had radiotherapy, we just focused on those that were looking at um, the first round. So mostly it was delivered at a cancer-specific hospital. Um, if people had had another round of radiotherapy, um, 10 of the 11, so very much most people went back to their um, that first hospital where they had um, their first initial round of radiotherapy. Um, mostly people uh, gave us an idea of what type of radiotherapy they had and um, mostly it was single beam radiotherapy. Um, uh, mostly people said that only one tumour was targeted, but there were a few people who also said that two or three or more tumours were targeted and most commonly this was um, tumours in the pelvis area. Um, some people, mostly people... Um, we asked about whether people, if they were on hormone blocking therapy at the same time, and um, most people weren't. Um, in terms of the impact of their radiotherapy, uh, these are numbers. So um, tumour reduction was a key one for people having radiotherapy. And um, there's a, the ends there mean the numbers. So that's just the raw numbers. So well, well, most people, you know, about 30 people said that um, their tumours did reduce in size. Um, 20, 20 indicated that they weren't sure. Um, 25 said that there was a change to inhibin levels. And, um, for, you know, uh, I think uh, positively, um, uh, six, uh, most people said that there were no changes to untargeted tumours. So we need to look at that. Um, in terms of impacting of quality of life, so I suppose um, while 11 people said that their quality of life improved, 15 said that it didn't make, there wasn't any difference, and unfortunately 15 thought that quality of life had decreased um, as, a, as a result of their uh, chemotherapy, uh, sorry, radiotherapy. So need to look at that a bit more and see if people have commented as to why that was the case. However, despite um, the fact that 15 thought that their quality of life was made worse, most people were really happy with having um, uh, their decision to have radiotherapy. And the key reasons for people not being happy was that they thought they were experiencing ongoing side effects from having the radiotherapy and also because it had li limited impact on, on the tumour. Okay. Um, we asked people about the different types of side effects that they might have experienced um, while they were having radiotherapy. And this just shows a range of um, uh, side effects people experience. So most commonly it was around fatigue or tiredness. Um, after that, it was uh, gastric issues. And then 19 people also commented that they had uh, vomiting um, and seven had uh, sore skin and then uh, also some hair loss. 
However, positively, most people thought that their um, health professionals did check for their side effects and that uh, also health professionals were involved in their care were really keen to help them manage their side effects. Um, so uh, so that was quite, quite positive to hear as well. Um, so we asked people if they had radiotherapy, if they discussed radiotherapy with their clinicians, why they didn't have it. And um, just some key sort of reasons why people were not having radiotherapy was that um, they were informed that the type of cancer wasn't responsive to radiotherapy. Um, sometimes it was a location of tumours, so it wasn't um, uh, inducive to having radiotherapy. Um, other people said that their disease was being was responding to other treatments at the moment, so they were thinking that radiotherapy could be uh, kept as either a later option if needed, or there was no need because because um, their care was sort of their treatment was working. Um, some people talked about potential damage um, of radiotherapy to other organs, and others just mentioned that because of the surgery or chemotherapy, there wasn't any tumor for radiotherapy, so radiotherapy wasn't needed. And I've just put some quotes for some of the comments that were in um, in the um, uh, in the survey, um, which sort of reflect what these themes were. So again, so people saying because they were deemed this type of cancer unresponsive to radiotherapy, tumours were too widespread and poorly placed. Um, and then the people who did have radiotherapy, we asked them if they would like to share any of their experiences uh, about having radiotherapy. And again, um, some of these comments, uh, comments uh, I've given a couple of quotes um, in the quote boxes here, but just in terms of themes, um, there was quite a few people who commented about the reluctance that they experienced from their medical team to consider radiotherapy um, and, and a sort of a plea for more doctors to be made aware of the possibility of radiotherapy to, uh, to treat this disease. Um, some people thought that um, side effects that could be experienced needed to be discussed more and people needed to be more aware of the of the um, potential really negative side effects that people might be um, might experience. Um, people talked about sort of having to fight to get radiotherapy, so really trying to uh, convince their clinicians to uh, to give to investigate the option of radiotherapy for them. Others talked about the really positive impact and support that they received from the radiotherapy team. And there were a few comments about how people found having radiotherapy much easier for them than the chemotherapy experience was. So there was quite a range of comments um, that really gave um, a, a, a broad view on sort of the some of the difficulties of, having a, of getting radiotherapy, but also some of the positive aspects of having um, a, a, a good treatment experience from having the care of the radiotherapy team. Um, so that's it from me. I just really want to thank you all for um, completing the surveys and thanks for Linda for keep on posting those uh, requests for people to do the radiotherapy survey. Um, and really, it's just been a joy to work on you and, and really um, allowing me to uh, have the privilege of, of being able to work with you guys who are so passionate and so knowledgeable in the area. And it's a really great example of we talk a lot about co-design and involving consumers and people with lived experience. In, and this has just been a great ex example of, um, you know, your team really leading the work and starting to identify the questions that you want um, answered and it's been great to be able to help you try to get some of those answers as well from from the survey work that we've done so um thank you very much and i'll just stop thank you vicky my screen now thank you that's lovely thanks vicky i've just got um a few questions for you on on the papers and things uh, a little bit further that um, have been put through from uh the survivor sisters group that uh, just to expand a bit further and I think one of the things is that has there been any particular feedback on the published paper? And, um, you know, is there any impact that you feel that it's had already? Yeah, um, I think um, I think at the moment the editorial was great. It's it's pretty rare that people get editorials um, for their papers. So that was a really positive impact from the get go. Um, in terms of citations, I suppose that's the other area we often um, talk about. We haven't had a lot of citations yet, but it's early and often that grows over time. So we, you know, 
we can look back in three or five years and see how many citations we've had. Um, I know that there was a bit of pickup in some media, so I did an interview with uh, with a radio station here in Australia. Um, I think Sue did some interview for an online magazine and there was some re reporting in an online medical sort of newspaper. Um, and there were also a couple of tweets from some different groups. So it's been a bit of a, a slow burn at the moment, but I think that will pick up at, over time as well. Thank you. Do, do you intend to repeat the survey at all in, in some sort of format and then compare the results? Um, <laughs> yeah look if you if you I'd, I'd love to I think um, you know you get a lot of information over time if you can repeat surveys over time and see how things have changed um, it, it depends on on the intervals so I think it would be really great to be able to to repeat something like that and, and with your help would get a really great sample again that would that be great excellent Moving on to the radiotherapy paper, thanks for taking us um, through the results so far. What are the next steps with that? Um, do we plan to issue a paper? Yeah, um, yes, and that's it, that's I've been a bit slow on that, so sorry about that. Um, but I'd like to get a draft of a paper um, by mid-year and sort of start working on, on shaping it to um, a journal that we can present to as well. And you, you mentioned a few areas that you'd like some more information on. Is that something that we may need to go back to the group to get some more data and clarify. Yeah, I think we could do some qualitative interviews with people and really get um, some nice uh, rich experience data of how people have found both having the chemotherapy but also, you know, what happens if they're fighting to get chemotherapy or that issue around, um, yeah, the, the difficulty that people have would be great. Okay. Finally, were there any commonalities in the responses that surprised you um, and that could drive potential future research? A bit? Uh, yeah. Um, in the first paper, I was sort of, um, uh, I think the, the, the greatest variation that we saw was around the follow-up care. Um, and I think that seems to be an area that that could have a bit more work on and trying to understand what the variation is and um, why why there's why there is variation and I think that could also reflect that there's really a lack of understanding from a medical perspective around what the best sort of follow-up care should be so I think that could be a good area to look at. That's fantastic thanks very much Vicky. Thank you. I think we go back to Simon now for theme two. Okay, so for theme two, rather than me sharing my slides, I'm going to uh, handball this one to Maria, who's going to uh, uh, take us through the genomic landscape um, an uh, analysis of uh, both adult and juvenile GCT. So I'll uh, hand that to Maria, if you're ready to share your screen. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Just give me a sec. Okay, so what we'll do in while we wait is uh, we'll go on to theme three, which is just elucidating. And so I'm just going to quickly go through this. There's a little bit of science here, but uh, I'm not going to try. I'm going to try and uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, discuss what the, the various aspects of these projects are. Um, and so. In this theme, we're elucidating the molecular pathogenesis of adult GCT. So really what that means is we're characterizing the particular molecular pathways that we know are important in the, in this, for, for the development of these tumors. And, and this, the, the aim really here is to inform for personalized therapeutics. So in the lab, we actually ha uh, utilize a couple of cell lines. One is a bona fide granulosa cell tumor cell line known as the KGN cells. And, and these were isolated from a 73 year old lady uh, who had a stage three recurrent metastatic tumor. And, and we know that these are bona fide uh, GCT cell line because they, it does harbor the FOXL2 mutation as a head uh, and that, that it is, um, uh, behaves in many ways like what we, one would see with a, a granulosa cell tumor. Um, we also utilize a, a, a non-cancerous cell line known as HGRC1s. And these are a, a non-luteinized granulosa cell line. So in other words, 
these cells are more like a granulosa cell uh, that is proliferating or, or dividing rather than the, the granulosa cells that have stopped dividing uh, after ovulation of the of the egg. Um, this cell line has the wild type or, or the, the normal FOXL2 gene, non-mutated FOXL2 gene. And uh, a lot of the work I'll just show you is being performed in the lab by one of our PhD students, Tian. So what Tian has been able to do is, is use a, a com computationally work out the structure of the wild type FOXL2 protein and the mutated form of the FOXL2 um, uh, proteins, the C134W, which is present in 95% of the adult GCTs. And rather than being uh, uh, overwhelmed by what you see here, um, this is just this crystal structure, if you like, of, of, a, of a protein. Um, and what you'll notice, in fact, is that there are, very, there are aspects of the protein that are very different due to this mutation. And this is just a single base pair mutation, which uh, Maria will be able to go back to afterwards and, and, and show you. But it's enough to cause a, a real change in the, in the structure of this protein. So what Tian has been doing in the lab, in fact, is using some, some new age uh, genetic technologies called CRISPR. I'm sure you've heard about CRISPR in, in all sorts of media and and TV programs and so forth. But what it allows us to do is go in precisely to change uh, one single base pair or one of those building blocks. And in this case, that very mutation uh, that is in the FOXL2 gene. And so what Tian has been able to do is, is in fact convert that mutation in the KGN cell line into a wild type or normal FOXL2 gene. But conversely, what she's been able to do is introduce the mutation in the normal cell line. And so hopefully hoping to make that look more like a, a tumorigenic type of cell line. And, and so by uh, using various different techniques, she's now comparing the differences between all these cell lines to try to understand the role of FOXL2, how it's playing a part in, in its interactions with other genes as well as other proteins in order to be able to understand what its role in the whole of the, um, the, 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 the causing of, the, of the, the tumors in the very first instance. And uh, some, she's just got some nice data that's just come off hot off the press, um, which she's busy analyzing at the moment. Um, and this is data that's looking at the, the uh, changes in gene transcription uh, that are, uh, are associated with the introduction or the reversion of, of this mutation. Um, so, so at this point, I might just leave this part. There's various other aspects of, of that particular theme, but I'll leave it open to some questions because I know that there's a couple of questions, I think, regarding theme three. Yeah, so um, again, some of these questions came from the Survivor Sisters group. So I am relaying those. Um, you mentioned that some of the research that you're looking at was related to changes in the gene gene transcription. Um, what will further research look like as it extends from this point? So um, where, where we are going with a, a lot of the, these pathway analysis analyses is that we might be able to identify uh, important uh, relationships between the known mutation and other proteins or genes that might be uh, responsible for driving the tumors. And, and by un understanding and identifying that, we're hoping to be able to then be able to get a, a firmer idea of perhaps which particular pathways we could target with more personalized, more, more targeted um, therapies in order to be able to, to perturb or to inter interfere with those interactions. And, uh, and, and that may then be a, a better form of treatment where those are, are, are stopped, those interactions are stopped. And have you um, 
found any commonalities that highlight an increased likelihood of tumor activation or mutation, either at initial diagnosis or recurrence? And so, if so, could that improve prognosis? Sure. So, so I guess uh, uh, I, 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 I'll show you this uh, picture here through the analyses of, we know that uh, our, our whole transcriptome, our whole exome, and now whole genome analyses. That, of course, we know FOXL2 is an early event, and these are the events that we're trying to work out what might determine if a tumor might become recurrent or aggressive. And one of the mutations that has been identified, not just by us, but other groups as well, is that there seems to be a higher number of mutations in this gene promoter or, or it's, a, it's an initiator of the gene transcription of this gene, TERT, T-E-R-T, -E or telomerase. And, uh, and what this mutation, uh, what we've found in this mutation is in fact that, um, that there is a very high incidence of this mutation in GCT, 42%. Uh, and this is a, a graph to show many different tumor types uh, as to where GCT actually, uh, uh, the, the incidence of, a lot of this mutation lies. So, uh, and you'll see here that there are certain tumor types where there's high incidence of the TERP promoter mutation. Um, interestingly, if you look at ovarian cancer, there's very low uh, incidence of this, but in GCT it's high, 42%. But one of the things that we've also uh, identified is in fact that for those with stage one disease, 30% harbor the mutation, but for those with stage three disease, about 70% harbor the mutation. And so this may be a prognostic uh, indicator of, of somebody who may have a more aggressive or, or, or prone to recurrence. And so we're, we're interested in looking at the role of this mutation as well. Um, analyses in the um, lab are, are focusing on that as well. Uh, and the last question is related to tumor samples. Have there been any other chemotherapy treatments that have been shown to be effective? Uh, so so uh, currently, no, no. Uh, we, we certainly know that other other treatments uh, uh, have not been very effective. Uh, I guess one could always think about in, in terms of a, key, a, 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 a targeted therapy, um, those who have a, uh, not a mutation, uh, an overexpression of a protein called C-KIT, for example, C-K-I-T, uh, they may be amenable for a treatment from a drug called Gleevec or imatinib. Um, there are some case reports in the literature to show that that's been effective for, for, for some. Uh, but in terms of a generalized treatment, no, and that's what, really what we're trying to do is, is to try and find that uh, through our, our pathway analysis, through the, find those um, targeted treatments that are more effective. Thank you very much. Okay, now. Um, hi, everybody. Apologies. Uh, having a few issues here. So I'll be talking to you about theme two, uh, de decoding the genomic landscape of GCT. So um, some of you may have written to me or I may have sent kits to you before. Um, I'm the one that sort of collects your tissue uh, and tries to help you out with collecting tissue. Okay, so just Simon's gone over this a little bit, but as we know that the adult form of GCT um, and 95% of GCT are the adult form are uh, defined by this mutation, the somatic, we call it a somatic mutation. And I'll go into uh, what somatic and mutations and all of that mean in a moment. Um, but it's defined, uh, so GCT are defined by this mutation where a cysteine in a codon uh, is substituted for a tryptophan um, at 134, at the position of 134. So we know that this leads to granulosa cell tumour, uh, but how, uh, what other changes there are, we are not sure of. Um, 
As Simon suggested, FOXL2 is uh, useful in the diagnosis of GCT, but it doesn't predict the behaviour such as stage or recurrence. Um, and this is the critical challenge um, for us. And so we're trying to identify mutations that predict and drive late recurrence and or aggressive behaviour in order to develop more effective targeted therapeutic strategies. The juvenile GCT do not have this FOXL2 mutation. So they are defined by the both the age and onset and histology. Um, and they represent about 5% of GCT. They haven't been systematically examined for any driver mutations. And yes, they don't have the FOXL2 C134 mutation. So in the majority of adult GCT, the FOXC134W mutation is present in both stage one and advanced tumors. So other factors or mutations must drive aggressive behavior. In juvenile granulosa cell tumors, the spectrum of driving mutations remains to be determined. So we hypothesize that mapping of the genomic landscape of both adult and juvenile GCT will identify critical driver mutations and that elucidating the somatic mutations driving these tumors will lead to improved prognosis and treatment of GCT. What do I mean by the genetic landscape and DNA, RNA, and so forth? So DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is found in the nucleus of a cell. It never leaves the nucleus of the cell. Um, it's arranged in a double helix and it consists of four base pairs or nucleotides called, well, we, uh, you'll, we see them as A, T, G, and C. They're adenine, thymine, guanine, and cyanine. And the ordering of these base pairs results in a specific genetic code called a gene. So each gene has its own specific order of these. Um, and uh, DNA consists of many genes and is itself organized into structures known as chromosomes of which humans have 23. So the genetic code in the genes and in our DNA tells our body how to make proteins. RNA, ribonucleic acid, is made from a single strand of DNA and transfers the instructions from the DNA to the ribosomes um, and helps uh, and gives basically the copy for the ribosomes to make protein. So mutations are also known as variants of changes in the gene's DNA sequence. These will then be transcribed copied into RNA where it then transfers to the cytoplasm, to the ribosome and translates it into a protein. So cancer occurs from mutations that involve the changes in the order of these base pairs, including deletions. So some bases may be, can anybody see the pointer? Um, we can see your pointer, Maria. Oh, okay. So uh, changes that include deletion. So we can get some nucleotides, one, three, two um, nucleotides deleted. We can get nucleotides added and we can get nucleotides substituted or shifted across. And these all lead to a different uh, protein perhaps. So what do we mean by the terms somatic and germline? Germline variants or mutations are changes to your DNA that you inherit during conception that are present in your germ cells and they are present in all the cells. Somatic variants or mutations are changes to your DNA that happen after conception, such as occurs in a tumour. They are not inherited. So variants in our DNA sequences are very common and they can be what makes us different. However, when they are associated with an adverse effect, they are referred to as mutations, especially when referring to those associated with cancer. So we have our DNA. Our DNA gets transcribed to RNA, which then leaves the nucleus goes into the cytoplasm and um, carries the information to a ribosome to make some protein. So in the case of the FOXL2 mutation, 
our DNA gets mutated to a different amino acid. This then gets translated to a different protein. So mutations, also known as variants, are changes in the gene's DNA sequence that may lead to an abnormal protein production. This protein is very different to the protein, to the normal protein. So this is just a schematic of how perhaps a tumour, uh, for one mutation, can cause tumour growth um, and uh, invasiveness. So we, we start with perhaps one mutation. In our case, it's the FOXL2 mutation. Uh, we then get growth of abnormal cells. These abnormal cells multiply. Uh, upon multiplication, they do inherit more mutations. So we get a whole lot of different cells, malignant cells, um, and continued tumour growth. This can then move into the um, blood vessels and lymph vessels and travel and cause metastasis and growth in other uh, parts of the body. So DNA sequencing may identify both germline, which we call normal, and somatic tumour variants by comparing the DNA sequence of cancer cells to healthy cells. Somatic mutations are those found in the tumour tissue DNA only. Germline mutations are those found in the tumour as well as the DNA from saliva, blood or non-cancerous normal tissue. So this is really important and why we uh, ask for both tumour samples and saliva samples, for example. So our assumption in the case of GCT is that it's not an inherited uh, disease and thus germline variants are more likely to be benign. We are therefore using the germline or the normal or saliva samples as our base to sort through the thousands of innocuous variants that um, our body, that occur in our cells uh, daily. So DNA sequencing is a process of how we can determine the precise order of these nucleotide bases within a DNA molecule. And this is extremely important uh, in our case when looking for uh, uh, different variants and what perhaps is going on with GCT. So there are two types of DNA sequencing. One's called whole exome sequencing. Uh, and this is sequencing the genome's protein coding regions only. So despite the exome's relatively small proportion of the whole genome, and it only accounts for about 2% of the whole genome, it encodes most of the well-known disease-related variants. We also have whole genome sequencing, and this is sequencing the complete genomic information of an individual, and it provides a more comprehensive view of an individual's genetic makeup. Uh, it can identify variants that are not present in the exome and include those in non-coding regions and structural variants. And this can be particularly useful for identifying rare or novel variants that may be missed by whole exome sequencing. So we did publish a paper on whole exome sequencing um, and the aim was to identify the, so the somatic mutations responsible for recurrence and aggressive behaviour. Um, and this is our publication, which um, was published in 2019. And this was the first comprehensive exome-wide analysis of the mutational landscape of GCT. Um, despite some of our, uh, despite not having matched tumour normal for many of the samples, uh, we did not demonstrate any recurrent mutations that define tumour recurrence or aggressive behaviour. And it suggested that second hit mutations are totally random in non-coding regions or that translocations should be sought. And that's where uh, two genes, uh, different, different gene combinations. Uh, we, as Simon mentioned, the terpomotor mutation, however, which um, is twice as frequent in advanced disease, may be of prognostic significance. We did find that mutation in... Um, 
in our samples. So we want to use whole genome sequencing to find out what's going on in the rest of the uh, genome for our uh, adult GCT. And we now also have some juvenile GCT. So whole genome sequencing, we collect uh, tissue. Uh, it's important that we have tumour and matched normal. So this is our germline and this is our somatic. We prepare our library, um, and this is a range of experiments where we cut up our DNA and add these adapters on. We then put it through what's called a sequencer machine, and this spits out um, thousands and thousands of these reads. So the human genome has 6 billion nucleotides, so you can imagine the amount of data that comes out of this machine, we then have to trawl through this and um, analyze it. So uh, just the scale of, of it, we have 20 million, approximately about 20 million genes, 23 chromosomes and 3 billion base, base pairs, which equals to 6 billion nucleotides or bases. So that's a lot of A, C, Ts and Gs that we have to uh, align and see what's going on. So some preliminary results though, we have looked at some juvenile GCT. We've put those through a pipeline. Um, and as seen here, we have these are our patients and these are the number of variants. As you can see, these are even though these are an extremely small proportion of um, the nucleotides or variants uh, compared to six billion in our genome, they are still there are still very many thousands that we've got to trawl through. Um, but we are currently looking through these um, different variants and seeing uh, which, if there are any um, shared variants between these these samples uh, and any. Um, pathways that they are linked to that may help us figure out what's going on with our juvenile. We are also using the, uh, the pipeline that we're setting up with our juvenile to then run our adult GCT. Um, once we have processed our juvenile, it'll be much easier to process our adult GCT and at the moment, we've sequenced, we have sequenced 10 adult GCT, and we are planning on sequencing some more, um, but we have quite a bit of data to trawl through at the moment, which is good for us. So future directions. So we need to keep analysing the juvenile GCT for high impact mutations in shared genes or pathways. And look at which may be targetable genes or pathways or changes in those. Uh, we will also look for gene rearrangements and other non-coding region changes. And then are there any genetic changes that may cause aggressive or recurrence? Um, not sure with our juvenile GCT that we have the numbers that may be able to give us those results. Um, and obviously then we need to validate those results through another set of experiments and publish those results. We will do the same for our adult GCT. So once we've run our juvenile through this um, pipeline, uh, we will analyze the adult GCT. Now we have done whole exome sequencing. So for our adult, we will be looking at um, some gene rearrangements and other non-coding region changes and look for perhaps things that may be targetable as well. Um, and again, are there genetic changes that may cause aggressiveness or recurrence? Validate these results and publish these results. And I just want to thank our lab. Um, Tianzi is the person who is a PhD student and she's currently helping with a lot of the bioinformatic analysis. It's part of her PhD project, which is great. This is Tihan. Obviously, Simon and Peter Fuller. Um, and then we've got their, these girls, they're both trans, <laughs> um, working on GCT with Simon, and that's me. Um, thank you for your attention um, and apologies for the um, technical.
technical issues. Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, there were some questions uh, submitted to us on this uh, particular theme. And uh, given that the tumor samples are still being analyzed, uh, can you tell us how much longer the samples will be collected for this purpose? So the more the more samples we have, the better, especially because it's such a rare cancer. Um, and with our exome study, we didn't have matched uh, samples, which was a um, which was really difficult for us to trawl through all those. Uh, germline and, and somatic mutations. We're really looking for somatic mutations. Uh, we are currently, if what we're doing is we've sequenced 10 adult GCT, we're planning on sequencing another lot of adult GCT um, and any more juvenile GCT because our numbers for juvenile are very low. And any other samples, from the say 20 uh, adult GCT that we get, we then validate any of the findings that we find, we will then validate on any more of the samples we have. So for as long as we can continue to collect samples, we will. Um, it is a rare cancer, but with the help of the GCT sisters, with, and usually we only see maybe one or two a year in Australia, uh, and that and so the process of being able to get tumours to analyse has been really difficult. But um, the help of GCT sisters and the whole group of women with GCT um, now uh, contacting us to donate their tissue has been a really huge help. The other thing is that with some of the tumour samples, depending on how long and how they've been processed, so um, a lot of the women know that we collect tissue blocks, um, depending on how they've been processed, the DNA or the quality of DNA we get is sometimes not great for the whole genome sequencing, but is fine for validating those results. So at the moment, we've got another year or so left on this uh, on this particular grant. So we want to continue, obviously, if we want to donate their tissue, um, collecting samples to help with this analysis. Thank you. Um, another question was, um, are you looking for a genetic link showing FOX cell 2 or any other genetic component uh, that may make it hereditary? So we know that um, there, there's, we, we know that FOX cell 2 is not hereditary. Um, so we, we assume that because we haven't found any um, changes, uh, germline changes. Uh, there are some germline changes which may lead to other cancers, but we believe that this cancer type, uh, there are somatic changes. So it's something that happens in the tumour uh, along its growth. FOXL2 obviously um, contributes to this. So we're not sure of the changes that happen after FOXL2. So we believe that it's there are somatic changes that happen within the tumour as it's growing that contribute to its growth, irregular growth. Uh, uh, and then I have one more question. Um, when do you expect to have a conclusion from the STEAM study that you're doing? I know you're going at least another year. Uh, is this one year, are you looking at it possibly being extended beyond? So we've had issues with COVID um, which have delayed the process, um, but we have recently made um, a lot of progress, especially with our bioinformatics analysis. And um, Tianzi has been a great help in that respect. We're hoping that we will uh, have some results 
uh, particularly for the juvenile by the end of this year. And we're hoping that we'll, um, because we've already processed adult GCT, we're hoping that we'll have um, some preliminary results uh, by the end of this year. Uh, and then perhaps some, some results that we can start validating at the beginning of next year. It takes a long time to trawl through um, 6 billion bases or nucleotides. Um, so, uh, yeah, so hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll have some more um, information to send out to you all by the end of this year. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> um, sure. Right now, we're looking at being close to the end of our time here. Simon, will you need to leave us no look we can keep going until for a little bit longer but uh, if that's okay. okay but but i might just add for uh the the first human genome was sequenced over 13 years it's how long it took to sequence the very first human genome and today we can we can probably sequence that within a few weeks um However, it's compiling all of that data together, which just takes quite a long time, as Maria mentioned. So it, it, think about it's for the human genome, it's about three million, three billion base pairs long. That's three billion individual uh, nucleotides all linked together. Um, and the sequencing output that comes from out of the machine is 150 base pairs. So it's like a huge jigsaw puzzle having to piece that all together, which is why that process takes quite a long time. Um, the other thing is, is uh, with that question about number of samples, uh, always we welcome samples because um, especially at the moment for juvenile GCT, uh, because we need to be able to confirm some of the findings that we're starting to see out of there. But our numbers being only six is quite low. It looks like it's not the same as the adult GCT, which has a, a, a high frequency FOXL2 mutation. Uh, we don't see that necessarily for the juvenile GCT. So, so the more samples, especially for the juvenile, it will be fantastic. Um, now, I'm just going to quickly share my screen again okay so uh the final the, the fourth theme that we've been looking at and i'll quickly go through this is is the theme for which is looking at a novel diagnostic inhibitor assay as a biomarker for ovarian cancer and the aim of this was really to establish a cost-effective highly specific and sensitive mass spectrometry based at bioanalytical me method to detect the alpha inhibin subunit uh, as a marker for GCT. Now we know that in fact uh, the inhibin assay is, is, a, is a good uh, assay in order to, to, to monitor for uh, recurrence. It is also a good assay if you can detect early uh, as an early detection marker as well um, if uh, one is to present uh, with early signs. Um, so what we've been trying to do, though, however, is, is, is to see whether we can develop an assay that is uh, more amenable for uh, the newer technologies in the, in the um, uh, diagnostic uh, laboratories or um, uh, pathologies in, in, uh, in institutions around the world. Um, so one of the areas that we've been trying to do first is, in fact, to see whether or not we can detect inhibin in a particular sample um, uh, using mass spectrometry. And so this is a, a just terminology here, but however, we've been using a, a method called mass spectrometry imaging. This is done by an, a PhD student in the lab, uh, Abby, um, who used uh, a, a technique that doesn't require any labeling or antibody to, to target proteins, um, as opposed to general pathological services um, where they do require antibodies to look for these different proteins. Um, and up to thousands of peptides can be identified at once, and the expression of proteins can be segmented to be able to show where they are, are expressed in particular tissues. So when Abby looked at um, a slice of uh, a, a tumor, um, she found in fact, and this is just a slice of a tumor, a very thin slice, two microns, 
um, you, you won't be even be able to almost see that on uh, um, uh, by eye uh, in terms of its thickness. But she was able to find four different fragments of the inhibin alpha subunit located throughout that whole piece of tissue. Um, and so you can see, in fact, it, it, this is highlighted, means that all, the, all of that area means that, that inhibin alpha is expressed. So we know that we can detect inhibin using mass spectrometry in a concentrated manner on a tissue sample. Um, and and that, so that's possible. But since, we've, since then, what we've been trying to do is identify inhibin in a blood sample, in a serum sample, and that's become a, a little bit more difficult. Um, and, and that's the reason for that is, is because blood is full of complex proteins. And so it's almost trying to find a needle in the haystack uh, in that sense. So we've been looking at ways of trying to remove a lot of those high abundant proteins in order to be able to perhaps have a more sensitive way of detecting inhibitors. So, so this is still an ongoing project and it's one that we're still trying to work through some of the, the, the issues, um, especially with um, the technology. Um, so I'll leave it at that point and, and maybe open for the questions for theme four. Okay, hi, uh, this is Koi. Um, regarding theme four, uh, we know that the research teams are looking for to find a way of improving the method of processing the inhibin blood test and thereby improving reporting time and accuracy of the test. We would really appreciate that, by the way, as a survivor. We would really appreciate that. Are you close to finding a quicker way to assay the inhibin tests? So... Uh, the answer is at the moment we we uh, have made progress, but we're not uh, as close as we were hoping to be when we first wrote the grant. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I guess I guess the issue there is, as I mentioned, that blood blood or serum sample um, is really complex. Uh, there are uh, uh, lots and lots of proteins, and uh, some of those proteins uh, mask, if you like, a really high those proteins that one would want. So uh, perhaps the inhibin assay that's being used at the moment is still an effective assay. It's inhibit in, where it's inhibin B uh, is used generally. Um, it's still a very good assay, uh, but it's it has its limitations in that not every single case may be detected by in, the inhibin B assay. But we know that almost 100% would be detected if we could find that, at, use that NS, an assay for inhibin alpha. Um, and so we've actually been successful in, in looking in overexpressing inhibin in the cell line and being able to find it in the being secreted in the media. So we know that the method should be sensitive enough. We've just got to get better at being able to remove some of those proteins which are masking it, masking it in the blood sample. So um, I think that we would, we're, we're making good ground, but it's, it's proven quite a, a hard, hard find at the moment. Okay. And uh, one other question on this. Have you identified any other potential tumor markers that could be used to monitor GCT? So, so that's a really, really good question. And Abby, uh, in, in a little bit of frustration, not being able to find, uh, you know, inhibin all the time in, in the samples that she was looking at, she did go on to, sh to look for other types of uh, uh, proteins that might be present. And, and I've just got a, a bit of preliminary data here where we've got primary tumor from, uh, uh, sorry, a prime, from material from a primary tumor and material from a recurrent tumor. Um, these are divided into FOXL2 positive tumors with a wild type TERT promoter. And uh, uh, that, that is the, the recurrent tumor has got a TERT promoter mutation. And uh, some of these genes are quite fascinating to look at when we see that, in fact, they're maybe lowly expressed in the primary tumors, but they are quite highly expressed in the in the recurrent tumors. And so some of these are popping out, and we're we're now actively trying to look at and further investigate what what the meaning behind those are. So so the answer to the question is yes. Uh, 
and, and some of these are players that we know are a part of pathways that are involved. So whether they're a bystander or whether they're actually in, uh, involved in the tumour or not is, is something that's still further defined. Okay. Great. All right, thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on to the last theme, and that's the combination therapy, a precision medicine approach to GCT. So this is really to test novel combination drug therapies, including smac I'll, I'll, I'll mention what they are in a minute, that specifically target GCT pathogenic signaling pathways. So smac are a, a compound that uh, effectively uh, removes one of the key proteins that protects the cell from dying uh, in, in the cell. Um, and, and GCT actually, and I mentioned it in an earlier slide, they expressed an, a protein called XIAP at quite high levels. And SPAC memetics are designed to be able to inhibit that, that protein because it protects the cell from dying, especially against uh, a, 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 an insult. Um, uh, whether it's a drug or UV or, or so forth. And so it's, it's a cell's way of protecting itself from dying. And, and so we've, what we've, we're interested in is using a combination approach whereby, first of all, we remove that protein from action and then we hit the cancer cells with another drug. Um, but rather than reinventing drugs, we're actually, uh, our aim is to repurpose drugs. And so in, in that line, we're, we're using a high throughput drug screening platform. Uh, and this is work that's been currently done by one of our, our PhD students, Chang, as you can see there. And it's using a screening library of about uh, 1400, over 1400 FDA approved drugs, uh, as well as other libraries that contain uh, kinase inhibitors, which are, are used for various other types of uh, cancers, and as well as a Cambridge Cancer Library, which contains many similar type of um, compounds. And so we're able to screen our cell line in combination with, um, with the SMAC memetics uh, 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 and in combination with these particular compounds using a robotic platform. And, and by doing so, what we have found, in fact, is that quite, as you see, quite a number of these compounds had no effect whatsoever. But what we've been interested in is under the line here, where uh, a number of the combination uh, combinations of the drugs with SMAC memetics causes the cells to die. And so we've been interested in looking at what these particular compounds are and whether they, they, they belong to certain classes and so forth. So this is all unpublished, but we'll be hopefully putting uh, that into publication before long. Um, the other area, this is, this is using that cell line I mentioned before, the KGN cell line. And so this is quite a, a, a fascinating study because in fact, you'll, you'll notice, as I mentioned, a lot of the drugs don't do anything whatsoever. So they're very ineffective. Um, but, uh, and these are a lot of uh, cancer drugs as well, but these are, are, are really interesting um, hits. Um, from that cell line, we then can be able to utilize a method that's just been established in the lab and quite successfully. And that's uh, performed here by one of our other uh, 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 research assistants, um, Chang Nguyen. As I mentioned before, we've really only got one transformed cell line for, the, uh, for our studies to use. That's the KGN cells. There's no other cell line that has the, K, uh, the FOXL2 mutation. Um, and when we get a cancer cell from a tumor sample, what we often find is that they spontaneously uh, stop growing in the, in the, in the culture dish. Um, and that's because of the nature of the cell. However, what we've now been able to do, utilize is a new three dimensional uh, methodology of being able to grow these cells uh, in, a, in a complex uh, that, that that is actually proving quite successful. So we got a little bit of a tumor sample here. And what we've been able to do, in fact, in this 3D culture is grow these cells as little tumoroids or organoids in a dish. And this has proven to be quite successful. And so the findings now from the drug study 
we've been able to put into this, um, it will hopefully be able to put into this system when we're able to acquire more of those tumor samples, especially the fresh frozen tumor samples, oh, sorry, fresh tissue, not frozen because that kills them, uh, but the fresh tissue uh, we're able to put into culture and, and then be able to test our drug combinations on this. And so that's proving to be quite exciting uh, and, and we're looking forward to being able to do that uh, very soon. The other methods that we're going to also need to do before we actually can pr proceed to any clinical trial with these um, uh, combination therapies is, is to use uh, animal models. So uh, uh, firstly, what we need to do is establish a model, and this is being done right this very moment, is to put inject KGN cells, the cell line, into a mouse uh, to be able to grow the tumor or these cells in the mouse. Uh, and then we can treat those mice with the compounds to monitor the tumor growth and analyze a whole lot of other things to do with um, how, how well that treatment is going. Um, and so that's uh, being done right this very moment. We've uh, received ethics to be able to do so. Unfortunately, we have to use animal models in this context, uh, but that they are uh, probably the best thing prior to a, a clinical trial. Um, and then lastly, using patient-derived xenograft models. So if we are able to get a fresh piece of tissue, we're able to actually transplant that granulosa cell that granulosa cell tumor into a mouse as well. And so like the previous model, we'll also then be able to treat the compounds and monitor for the tumor growth as well in a real piece of um, uh, tumor material that's gone into the mouse. And so those uh, studies have, have been going, we've been uh, establishing this model. We haven't been able to treat the mice as yet because we, we have to establish, first of all, whether the, the, this is a successful way of um, being able to uh, grow the tumor samples. And we've shown that we can do so. So we will be hoping to move into the, the next phase of this where we can treat with the, those various compounds, um, combinations that we've identified. Um, and and so I shall leave that at that point, and uh, I'm happy to take further questions on that. Thank you, Simon. I think uh, it's both uh, Kim and myself are going to ask you a couple of questions, so I'll kick off. Um, have you found any particular class of drugs that are showing any promising results? And have you noticed any difference between the adult and the juvenile? GCT in that response. So, so great question again. Um, and, and this is, I guess, showing uh, certain classes or the, these are individual types of drugs, uh, but I might just go here. There, there are drugs that uh, we, we're, we're finding, especially this group here called the HDACs, which are the histone deacetylase, um, uh, their enzymes that are responsible for unwinding and, and winding um, DNA. And uh, the combination effect using a cl this class of drug is actually seems to be, uh, looks quite promising. So we're going to be uh, continuing having a look at this side of things. Um, we've also identified other, uh, it's one particular nuclear hormone uh, receptor or nu nuclear receptor, I should say, um, that, that is also promising, that's PPR gamma. Um, and so that's going to be put into the uh, mouse model as well. So, um, so yes, we are seeing some family of drugs which seem effective, uh, and uh, we're hoping that this will show in the animal studies to proceed to a, a clinical trial. Now, the question about adult versus juvenile, um, the answer is no. We, 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 we can't really determine that because we haven't been able to uh, really uh, acquire enough samples from the juvenile. Um, we have got a fresh sample, uh, which we have successfully done the, uh, that 3D method, and we have successfully grown in the mouse. So hopefully we can answer that question just on that one sample. Um, but I think the nature of the cells being very, very similar in some ways with many of the, the, the sort of profiling uh, would mean that, yes, maybe, maybe some of these um, uh, treatments might, might be equally amenable. Thank you. Um, 
Along those same lines, if you are able to identify a combination of treatments um, that could present as a, as a treatment option, you mentioned that most of these that you're testing are already FDA approved. So would that have to go through cl clinical trials or would it be available fairly quickly for patients? So the, so the reality is, is yes, they would have to go through a phase three, phase four clinical trial. They don't have to go through the original efficacy type of um, and, and sort of um, top, toxicity profiling and so forth, because they've already been approved. Um, uh, so that's the whole purpose of repurposing these drugs really, is that we can expedite the use of them in the, clin uh, in the clinic. Um, but, but I guess uh, the answer is yes, we would still need to proceed with clinical trial, uh, uh, but it, hopefully that would be quite a, a, quick, a much quicker process than if you had to start from the very beginning. Okay, thank you. Um, Simon, have any of the tumour samples been tested with HRT to determine if there's a negative reaction? So I know this is a, a real area of conjecture. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, I guess if you look at the, um, uh, what the international guidelines are, there's that HRT is not recommended because these are uh, supposed, well, these are hormone sensitive um, tumours. Um, in fact, what I, th I think our studies are showing that th there are certain oncogenic or, or cancerous pathways, molecular pathways, that seem to be uh, uh, inhibiting the, the estrogen pathway. Um, so what we found in the laboratory, at least, is that if you treat the cells with estrogen um, and so forth, it actually has no effect on the cells. Um, it doesn't cause them to grow any quicker, but it doesn't stop them from growing either. If we use anti-estrogens, we see no effect either on, on, the, on the cells as, as such. So, um, so I guess it doesn't really help answer the question, but um, HRT, uh, I know it, it, it's the idea would be feeding perhaps the tumor. Uh, we, we, we think that in fact, HRT may not be necessarily feeding the tumor, but it may be sort of uh, encouraging the vasculature, the, 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 the formation of blood vessels, which might then be a, a reason why sometimes the tumors grow because there's an increase in the blood vessels um, that are formed. Um, so uh, it's an area that we still are quite unsure about. It, GCT ex overexpress uh, one of the estrogen receptors, but it's the estrogen receptor that is opposite to what breast cancer, what drives breast cancer. So estrogen receptor alpha is in breast cancer, which drives the, the, the tumors, but estrogen receptor beta in, is by and large should actually stop the tumors from growing. Um, and so uh, our studies have indicated that in fact, the estrogen receptors are, are stopped from working by these other pathways that are at play. Interesting, thank you. And then the last question is um, you, you, I think have already mentioned some personalized therapeutics and that being one of the goals. Do you think that that is on the horizon for GCT? Uh, I certainly do. I think that uh, we, we're, we're moving into the era of um, genetic uh, testing, genetic sequencing as, as Maria is showing. Uh, and before long, it, it, uh, it will no doubt be almost standard. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that you will be able to hopefully be uh, have a tumor sequenced uh, as part of the standard testing to be able to find those personalized, more targetable treatments just for uh, individualized treatments. Uh, that's certainly on the horizon, I think, in, not just for GCT, but for most tumor types that will occur down the track, how we've seen, a, 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 how quickly we've seen this area uh, blossom. Um, so uh, no doubt that that will be, will, will happen. Uh, it probably happens sooner than we, we think, 
um, which will be really good. Um, but in the meantime, of course, we have to do all this research leading up to that point. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of our questions. So uh, I'll just kind of close this up and say thank you to Simon and Maria and Vicki um, for joining us here tonight. Thank you to Koi and Linda and Sue. Um, Sue was kind of the, the driving force behind getting this together. So we appreciate that. And to all the sisters who are watching or who, who are watching the recording, um, thank you for being a part of it. When we started 10 plus years ago, um, I think we knew we had something special. We knew we had an opportunity, but we didn't really know what to do with it. We had all of this information and, you know, we knew that, that it would come in handy at some point. So thank you all for helping us bring that vision into reality. Um, for those of us who were diagnosed in a time when there really wasn't a lot of information available, um, knowing that we're sort of paving the way for future women who are diagnosed with GCT um, to have a to have better options and to have more information available really is truly a, a astonishing for us to be a part of that. Um, so we look forward to your future findings and knowing that we're making a difference in the lives of women diagnosed with GCT. So thank you all again. And, and as researchers, we need to really thank you. Thank you for the, uh, the collaboration, the, 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 the such a wonderful spirit that exists amongst your group and uh, a willingness to, to interact with us as researchers. <laughs> Uh, in order to be able to help you better for the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.